you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jo Evershed. I'm the CEO of Cauldron Science. And um, I'm going to talk today about new frontiers in behavioral science, and in particular, online experiments. At Cauldron, we make specialist software for behavioral scientists. Behavioral science covers all manner of disciplines that study how humans think, feel, and behave on their own and in groups. Um, we're then more often referred to with very speci specific words, so psychologists, neuroscientists, behavioral economics, social psychologists, educational psychologists, speech and language therapists, all of these would be classed as behavioral scientists. They're understand interested in how humans behave. Behavioural science is used to create interventions and nudge people to act in their own and society's interests. They're often small nudges that make long-term consequences more salient or short-term gains less prominent. I've, I've got some examples here that, that people know about, so you get a sense of what, what we're talking about here. Um, so, and these are familiar examples that come out of real research on humans. So the UK Nutrition Pie chart here that was... Um, we made a research platform to help investigate what kind of food labelling is going to change people's behaviour the most. Um, this isn't the, the optimal design, and, and it has changed since then. Um, but what this is meant to do is to show you, based on this pie chart, that there are, you know, the salt content in this is bad, so maybe you shouldn't eat it. What people said they found difficult is they didn't know with something like this, well, should I eat it or should I not eat it? I mean, it, it's got like a no, a yes, 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 and a maybe. Yeah. Um, so I don't really know what to do. So now they think trying different types of labelling, which are, are going through um, research at the moment of, of things that you can eat by the bucket load, things you can eat by the cupful, and things you should just eat by the teaspoonful. So, so mayonnaise is like a, it's a teaspoon type thing. Spinach leaves, buckets, I don't care, knock yourself out. Sort of what they, you can see that that would be more useful. Cigarette packaging, this has been very controversial. Can you have such a thing as an ugly colour? Or if you really like smoking, is that going to become a highly desirable colour because you're going to associate it with something you like? But the problem here is that while smoking rates have deteriorated hugely over the last 10, 10, 20 years, some smokers persist. It's baffling to those of us that don't smoke why they persist, but they do. Um, the latest packaging that puts the anti-smoking adverts in the hand of the smokers so that they can't ignore it is expected to uh, have an effect on some of these smokers. There will, after that, still be some who persist. Um, each person that changes from being a smoker to a non-smoker increases their health and reduces the expected cost to the NHS and to the government and to taxpayers and to you and me. So this is something that, that society is interested in doing. Um, HMRC uh, are tax collectors. The so-called nudge unit, the Behavioural Insights team, have added a couple of sentences to the tax reminder letter. This is a very carefully researched sentence. They tried lots of permutations of the sentence to work out which one works the best. The sentence is something like, the one that works, 95% of taxpayers in your area pay their taxes in full and on time. And that sen sentence places you in a social context. And the social context is important, as we heard earlier from the lecture from the psychologist, that you go, well, I, I want to be like everybody else. Uh, and I want to do my bit for society. And then you're more likely to pay your taxes uh, in full and on time. Now, this increases the revenue to the government by somewhere between 3 and 6%, depending on your environment. Doesn't sound like a lot to you and me. To the government, that's billions. So, so, uh, so small effects at a large scale have huge impact. The final one, I wanted to put in an, an, an example from education, though it's hard to find, but this is breakfast clubs. Um, kids from deprived areas come to school hungry and, and, and they can't concentrate and they behave badly because they're hungry all day. So the, the most effective intervention, uh, educational intervention you can do for kids is to feed them. That simple. Also helps with brain development. If, you're, if you can make sure they have one meal a day, which has got a range of nutrients, that's really good. Somewhat depressing that in the UK, still, there are kids who are nutritionally deprived. But these are behavioral in interventions. And the exciting thing about behavioral interventions is that, unlike medicine, they are relatively cheap. In the case of the HM Revenue and Customs one, that was changing the printing of one line of a letter that was going to be sent anyway. It's, it's practically, the cost is practically negligible. Oh, next one. Here you go. So, to use behavioural science to benefit society, you must first understand and then alter human behaviour. And that's why many of us study psychology, to understand behaviour. And the next bit is, is how do we change it? There is enormous potential to address some of the biggest, um, biggest problems affecting society today. Just to name a few, obesity, smoking, 
these are health-related ones, could put into their diabetes. Uh, the NHS budget is around 100 billion. It's a bit higher than that now. 25% of that budget goes on lifestyle diseases, things that we do to ourselves knowingly and willingly. If you could come up with interventions to stop people, well, to get people that sort of eat healthily, stop smoking, stop drinking, go outside, take some exercise and get some sunshine, that's 25 billion that we've saved. <laughs> So this is really important stuff. But there are other challenges as well. Climate change, plastics, um, treating mental health, providing appropriate remediation to kids with learning difficulties so that they get specialist education at the point that they need it. Why do people not save enough for retirement? Do you believe that you're suddenly going to win the lottery between now and when you retire? Perhaps you should start putting five pounds away now. I, I wish I'd started putting five pounds away when I was, you know, in my 20s. I'd, I'd have some money by now. But, you know... Next year, I'll do that. So all of these things, behavioral scientists are working to change how we behave. But, and here's the problem, behavioral science is slow to do because it needs human participants as research subjects. If you've run an experiment, you know how painful this can be. Historically, humans, these humans have had to come into the lab to be tested, and this presents a number of challenges. It's hard to test large numbers of people and therefore get enough statistical power. So you sort of know, well, Maybe it, maybe it works. Not sure. It makes it hard to reach critical populations who don't travel easily. For instance, children, the, the elderly, those with specific disabilities who are often geographically dispersed. If I want to do a study on deaf children, I can't find 100 of them here in London. It's, that's going to be tough. Um, it's even harder to run, harder if not impossible to run longitudinal studies. If you need the same participant to come into your lab every day for um, two months, that's not going to happen if, if you've got to get them to come into the lab. So consequently, psychologists have resorted, as we know, to testing undergraduate psychology students. Turns out they're a bit weird. <laughs> they're not representative of the wider population. And so we discover things that are true of rich, democratic, white, mostly female people who are interested in how other people think and feel and behave. So, yeah, something, but not everything. Um, so together these problems mean that, that despite the promise of solving society's biggest problems, there hasn't been much success yet. But the, so the internet and modern computing changes all of this. It's now easier than ever to collect data from people all over the world online. And what's missing is the tool to put these experiments online and to reach these participants so that they can take part in your experiments on their computer from home. You can say, I want to do a study, and I want it stratified by age and gender, and I want 20 people in each of these groups, and I want half of them to be overweight and half of them to be underweight. You go to YouGov, you say, that's the panel that I want. They go, yeah, give me some money. I can find you those 2,000 participants to respond to, to respond to your study, and you can have your data by tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs> I can put that cost into my grant. That's fantastic. That completely changes how we're going to do research. What was, but what was difficult then is getting your experiment online. And that's why we've created Gorilla. Gorilla is a cloud platform. It's a complete professional tool for online professional behavioral research. Uh, oh, gosh, I did, that, that, that was that slide. Now we'll jump on to the next one. So... A little bit more about what Gorilla is. With Gorilla, you can design, deploy, and analyze your online experiments effortlessly. There's a simple point-and-click interface, which is easy to use. It's sort of a bit like Excel, a bit like PowerPoint, a bit like things which are really familiar to you. Um, and you create your experiment. You start off creating your questionnaires and your tasks, and you set what thing, the variables that you want to manipulate within them are. You could create, a, like I don't know, a relational reasoning task, or um, you can display audio stimuli, you can display video stimuli, you can have people respond using the keyboard or the mouse or by typing things. You've got a whole range of display options and response options. You then stick all of those individual components, so the questionnaires and the tasks, together into an experiment tree, and you might decide this is a within participant experiment or a between participant experiment. Or it might be a switching protocol where everybody starts off doing this task, and at a certain point they go, oh, I don't want to do this anymore, and they do another one. You go, oh, no, I'm bored of this, I want to go back to that one. And you see when people switch from one task to the other. You can do all of these things in Gorilla. Um, and then when you're ready, when your experiment is ready and you've tested it and you've looked at the data and you're happy that it's collecting what you need to know, you can deploy it online. So you can either deploy it online with a simple link, put it on Facebook or Twitter or send it to your friends, or you can use these wide range of recruitment services. Will some of you have heard of Prolific? So Prolific is a, a, another behavioral science company. They specialize in providing 
participants to uh, behavioral scientists and you pay them the participant fees and a small commission, you give them the link and they then get sent to your experiment and back again and you can have your data. One of our clients spent a couple of days creating an experiment and then collected 400 participants worth of data over a lunch break. Before using, before using Gorilla, creating the task would have taken her several months, coding it in MATLAB, generally pulling out of her hair and aging 10 years in the process. Um, <laughs> and then they'd have gone on to the data collection, which would have taken another several months or needed an RA to help her do it. So she, she's got teaching commitments and can't be sat there in a room doing it the whole time. So our clients who are using Gorilla are using it to understand how people choose which plate of food is healthier. So what is it that makes you think something's a balanced meal and is going to be sufficiently filling but is also healthy? Um, uh, so a, a PhD student who's using it is using it to create an early screening for children at risk of autism. So she's identifying people who've got a sibling who has, has a diagnosis of autism and they're in the two to four age group. They're getting them to do a sort of um, an SSRT task, a stop signal display task type thing. Um, and because uh, they're trying to look, get a sort of a measure of their inhibition circuits because there's a, there's a correlation between that and autism, I gather. Um, uh, you can use it to understand how decisions around pensions are made, for instance. So the use cases is as varied as there are problems in the world. Whatever your question is, you'd be able to operationalize it and code it up. Uh, and this is what people are saying, which is really nice when people write nice things like that. Gorilla is quite simply a revolutionary product for the field of psychology. For the avoidance of doubt, you don't need to code. This isn't going to be that hell of sitting there and going, I don't know why this doesn't work. And you spend two hours testing things, and then somebody comes along and goes, oh, you're missing a comma, which is really painful. Um, so yeah, so, so what we've provided you with is a, a fully tooled service, which, uh, which allows you to be digitally creative. This is, I think, the word we want to think of. You're being creative, but you're not having to code. It's not, it's not Word where you're receiving it or, or, and typing things, but you're getting to create an experience out of little building blocks. Um, Gorilla isn't only for researchers. It can also be used to revolutionize teaching and better prepare students for jobs that require digital experimentation of which there are a growing number. Um, what was I going to say there? Uh, so marketing is one area where, where people want more and more digital experimentation. In the NHS, nurses, speech and language therapists, creating tools for their customers. You could, if you had a, somebody who, who needed some CBT and you felt, actually, I could create something for them, which they could do every day. I could create them a little meditation, very bespoke to them. I've got a sort of framework which I've created for my client. Let's work with them to put in the content that they think will help and the messages that they think will help and some questions and answers. And I can do that for this patient. And then the next day you see another patient and you create one bespoke for them and one bespoke for them. You could do that. And then they could sit there using this at home. You'd get the metrics back. And then next week when they come back, you could analyze their responses and go, oh, okay, well, even though you say, and when I ask you today, you say, how have you been the last week? You go, Awful, I hate it, life's just awful. Let's have a look at your data. You actually said of the last seven days that it was great, 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 and yesterday was terrible. It turned out the day before you've been drinking alcohol. Do you think maybe you want to think about your behavior? And so you, can, you start pulling these things out with patients and really helping them to be in charge of their own health. But going back to how this is used in, in teaching, what's really exciting for students is that from day one, these are students at UCL, by the way, who've been using Gorilla for a couple of years now, um, is that from day one, they're asking their own scientific questions and getting the data to get their own answers. So they're doing real science. They're not now, well, obviously, they're still science, studying science history. Uh, there's a whole load of papers and there's a body of knowledge that you need to acquire. But you also want to be learning how to ask questions yourself, how to operationalize an experiment. Um, so what they typically do is they're running an IAT, so they're, 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 um, they're in test of implicit attitudes. Um, and uh, the Dan sets them one that they, they all go and do. Um, I can't remember what the topic of that one is. It's sort of uncontroversial. And then they go away in seminar groups and create their own IATs, asking a, a question that they're really interested in. So um, 
So one group came up with, well, you know, so do blondes really have more fun than brunettes? So that was their idea. That's what they wanted to answer. First year psychology students. It's great. Like, it's a really simple question. So they went and got their stimuli. They had some pictures of blondes and some pictures of brunettes. And they run their study. And they find out that blondes really do have more fun than brunettes, right? <laughs> And then they sit down in their seminar group and they present this data and somebody else on the other side, because they're like in seminar groups, they're in sort of two teams, goes, really? Show me your stimuli. And so they've got these pictures of blondes, like smiley, big grins, makeup, big blonde hair. And then there's the pictures of brunettes, all very severe with glasses, very, very serious. And go, that's not what you've discovered. You've discovered whether smiley, happy people are associated with happy things and whether, you know, severe, stern people are associated with seriousness. So well done. But no, that's not what you tested. And while that's rubbish science, it's a fantastic learning opportunity. Because if you come out of that going, I'm going to read that method section in those papers, and I'm going to look at the stimuli that they said they'd done, and I'm going to check that I believe that the researcher has operationalized this experiment properly, you've created a better student. You've created a better future researcher who knows how to do good science. When this generation of, of UCL students hit the, hit the um, leave their degree and go on to um, go into industry, they're going to be equipped to create digital assessments and interventions for their employers. You're going to see the step change in that digital creativity. If they're working for a marketing company, they could use a semantic priming task to look at implicit brand associations between this big brand and that big brand. If they were going into education, they could create some learning tasks for people. I created a little game for my, my son, he's two, where um, the pictures of animals come up and then there's the auditory sound where it goes woof, 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 and he has to, has to click the dog. That's what he was playing when he was like a year old. Now you could, you could see how you could change that. It would say dog or you could have the text of dog come up and you're gradually just playing with things, giving him exposure to these ideas. But it's all playful, it's all fun. When you get it right, you get it like, yeah, well done. All there held in the app. These are little things that you can create without having to code. Now, psychology is one of the most popular degrees because it combines training of the humanities with statistics and data analysis. Psychology students are massively employable. They've got that wonderful hybrid of skills. And consequently, students go into this wide range of careers. Some examples of what might have happened next. Let's say a psychology student goes into investment banking, and they've got the skills to objectively assess the risk appetite of a client. That could be great for a bank, right? They go look up things like, ah, oh, this is how you can assess risk appetite. I could look at discounting. I could do these different things. Let me get a bunch of our clients who they say their investment profile is this or this or this. Let's get them to do this online test. And then you can say, you know what? You say you've got an appetite for high risk, but all of our testing tells us you're really unhappy with high risk investment. Maybe we should just scale you back a bit and just see whether you feel better. And the client goes, oh, I, yeah, I suppose I've always been really uncomfortable, but I felt like I should have a high-risk investment portfolio. But you're right, each year I'm sort of disappointed. So, so that's what could happen there. Speech and language therapists would be able to create assessments for themselves and interventions for their clients. They could make them specific to what that, that client is struggling with. Market researchers, uh, I think we've spoken about them already. What, what about lawyers? Because psychologists do go on to study law. I, I baffles me why, but yes, they do. Um, but they, I mean, I think the struggles here for the lawyers is what do we do about digital data, validation of interventions, ethics and compliance? These are all quite thorny issues in behavioral science at the moment. So I think um, Lord Chris Holmes said at the beginning of the conference, the fourth industrial revolution means that digital, digital skills are not just for IT professionals anymore. And I completely agree. But what I, what I think is, is really exciting is having digital skills doesn't mean needing to code. It means being able to use digital tools flexibly and creatively to create new experiences for people. And you can do that without coding. Uh, next screen. So online research has implications for the future of behavioral science. Large-scale longitudinal studies on diverse and specific populations go from near impossible to best value for money. This will fundamentally change what grant applications get awarded because the best value for money will now, may now be for online research. And I predict we're going to see a proliferation of scientifically validated di digital diagnostic tests, assessments, and interventions coming out of university research. I know this to be true because we've created some. Um, these three are educational games that we've created. Wow, that's, that text has come out funny. 
It's meant to be the Star Wars text. Anyway, um, the first three are educational games covering primary maths. That one teaches deaf children how to speech read, which helps them develop phon phonological awareness and therefore helps their reading. Uh, this is the word supermarket, which we use to look at that food labeling that I just talked about earlier. Um, and Hive is a platform that looks at how humans behave in groups, which in increasingly we need to know how people influence each other online to behave differently than expected. Um, the wood supermarket, again, you can change, you can change the, um, the images uh, and you can give people healthier swaps. You can do all sorts of things. But imagine where that could go. Imagine a supermarket that maximizes your health choices rather than maximizing profit. You could opt to go, oh, I'd quite like to go shopping in a way that's going to support me. Even prepare to pay a membership fee to use your service. So the supermarket still gets their nice profit, but you get a better and healthier shopping experience. The DECAL portal, this is a assessment portal, provides specialist uh, speech and language therapists um, uh, with tasks to use on deaf patients. So if you're an SLT, a speech and language therapist, you know how to assess the vocabulary of somebody who can hear, you've got all these tools to use, but what if you've got a deaf patient? So these are digitized tests, they're online, you pay a small fee, you can sit the child down in front of them, you help them go through the test, and at the end of it you can go, this is where this person is compared to the norms of their age and, and education. So that's really helpful tools. We've also worked on a chatbot that provides specialist care to those suffering from chronic pain. Chronic pain, something like 50% of patients over the age of, of people over the age of 50 suffer from chronic pain. It's awful. Don't be really careful with your backs, by the way. Um, and, um, and providing care to them, doctors spend a lot of their budget just sitting and talking with these people who should, be able, should with the right care, be able to treat themselves. So we created this chatbot so that somebody could chat to it and go, oh, I've got this level of pain and uh, what can I do? And it would suggest things. Why don't you go for a walk? Why don't you go and talk to a friend? Sometimes it's about distraction. Sometimes it's about stretching. Sometimes it's about having a bath and flooding your upward pathways. All of these things are possible for improving your experience of pain. Um, so we're entering, what I'm trying to suggest is that we're entering a period when behavioral scientists will create scientifically informed and validated assessments and treatments to be used in the front line to make people's lives better. And I think that's really exciting. So all the projects above came out of simple proofs of concepts that could have been done on Gorilla. As we see, using technology creative, creatively is the key skill. And that's why it's important to teach future behavioral scientists digital experimentation. Digital experimentation is a creative skill that combines a, um, a vision for an insight, you, you want to create something, a robust experimental design, and a very good statistical analysis to make sure that you have uh, created an effect. So if you work with people whose behavior you want to understand, or perhaps change, then Gorilla can help you. You can create experiments to understand how and why they are behaving a certain way. And as we saw at the beginning, some really simple changes, for instance, the rewording of a sentence, can have a massive impact on behavior. To get started with um, online research, sign up for a Gorilla account. It's free. If you speak to me afterwards, I can and get your email address. I can give you 10 tokens so you can try it out. That's me. Nice. I think I'm just starting.